he just like keeps following not necessarily the trends but <laughs> my apologies what did you think was gonna happen there <laughs> i was trying to find a good space <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. My name is Sean Hartman. I'm joined by my regular co-host, founding member of the number one Max Rebo and the Jizz Whalers cover band, Peter Cook. All right. I like it. (laughs) Hello, everyone. And uh, social media director for Bud's Best Cookies, Jeremy Ruggles. (laughs) So, And we have... A special guest host today as well, Earl Jordan, local DJ, record collector, and aficionado. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, this week we are doing another selection that I picked out. We are going with a super funky late 70s disco record by one Hamilton Bohannon. This album is called Cut Loose from 1979. I picked this record because I'm pretty huge Bohannon fan. He's one of those guys, anytime I find one of his records, I buy it. I was like pretty instantly into his stuff when I first came across it. And I find that like nobody ever talks about this guy. I've been so many times working in record stores over the years that someone asked me for suggestions on soul records or they're saying they're looking for soul and funk related stuff. Have you heard Bohannon? No one like once or twice someone's like oh i love bohannon no one ever talks about him <laughs> yeah there were two of his songs on youtube yeah the, there's not a ton exists. 27 views a piece <laughs> yeah and the, the thing i was finding from looking up different like reviews and information that you can find on him is like people's opinions are all over the place like if you go to allmusic.com i think his highest rated album is three and a half stars the one we're doing today is two stars But then, like, there's an extensive article on Wax Poetics about him where they're talking about him, this, like, this godfather of house music and disco and funk and saying he's, like, one of the most underappreciated hidden gems in the world of soul music. You can make your own opinions. Not even the critics agree on this one. The first record I bought from Bohannon was an album called Keep On Dancing, which came out in 1974. I think that was his second record. I found that in... uh, Harvey's Basement here in Kalamazoo. I know, Peter, you're familiar with Harvey's Basement. Jeremy, have you been down there? Is that the old guy who sells a bunch of records out of his basement? Yeah, that's the that's the Kalamazoo gem that like people are hesitant to tell you about it most of the time because yeah, they don't want yeah. it totally cleaned out. You know, we're going to have to edit this out of the <laughs> podcast. We're not giving you his contact information, but... I had a girlfriend who didn't tell me about it for at least a year. <laughs> I've always going. known about him, but I've never actually went and visited that's the fine. actual basement. But that's I've fine. heard about him for years. And Yeah, you, you go ahead. Feel free to stay away from Harvey so I can keep buying the gems. Or I'll... <laughs> that was around the time when I first started doing more like soul-based stuff on WIDR here in town, moving into doing a soul radio show and needing to just do a ton of research, get my basics together. So I was going down to Harvey's pretty regularly and just buying like all kinds of soul and funk records from his 50 cent bins and trying them out and learned about a ton of stuff from there. And Bohannon's one of the ones that's really stuck out to me since then. I'm sure Harvey recommended Bohannon. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I also, another early pick from his was an album called Summertime Groove from 1978, which is the one that right, came out right before Cut Loose, the one we're talking about today. That one is his most popular, best-selling album. I picked Cut Loose because it's probably the least valuable of all of his records and probably the first one that you might find, probably the most common one to come across. I stand behind every single record he's put out, so I kind of wanted to approach it from the angle of if you like it and you like this record, it'll be probably the first one you see, and then you can just buy any of them after that, and you'll get a similar level of quality. You celebrate the whole Bohannon catalog. Absolutely. I mean, not everyone does, but I stand behind it. Yeah, if you're DJing, I think it's really an ex- uh, exceptional 
just artists to have because most of his cuts are pretty long so you can just let it play it's groovy it's funky it's entertaining there's lots of great keyboard parts and mm-hmm. just everything so if you want to DJ, that's a good artist to get all those records because you'll definitely use a lot of it. I noticed that they all were kind of the extended mix. Totally. <laughs> Just by yeah. nature. He was kind of a, a disco godfather in that way. Like, he came out of the Motown world, which was, you know, that like factory production, two and a half minute songs, in and out, fit out of 45. And he was like, actually. How about 10 minute songs where like the groove is just like locked in from start to finish and just like keeping those dance floors packed with that repetitive groove. And turns out he kind of knew something about what was coming later on down the road in the music world. You want to let him hear some? Yeah. Let's go ahead and start with the first track off this album. Self-titled cut loose. We're not going to play all the uh, seven minutes and 44 seconds, but uh, let's hit it from the beginning. So that was the opening and self-titled track from Hamilton Bohannon's 1979 record, Cut Loose. Bopped hard. Yeah. It's it's like on that level for the whole record. I mean, most like funk records from the time period will have like an opening banger and then like maybe a mid-tempo and then a ballad and then maybe another banger and then two more ballads and close off at like mid-tempo. But this record just goes hard like the entire time. And a lot of his records are that similar vibe. Cut Loose. Yeah, the party just does not stop. Yeah, <laughs> no need to. I try to do a lot of reading up on Bohan, and there's not a ton of interviews with him. Apparently, he's he's kind of infamous for being very in control of his own career and making his own decisions and not caring at all about the pressures of what people want him to do. And that applies to the music he's creating, how much work he does, and also like his interviews and his public persona. It's very calculated. He's very in control. And people seem to have a lot of respect for him in that regards. Um, He's also still alive. People aren't sure how much work he's really doing anymore, mostly in retirement. But there's also a lot of rumors that he might be recording under pseudonyms or like ghostwriting tracks or like producing people without credits, which makes sense. I mean, this guy has been like working consistently since he was like 10 years old. He started so young in the music industry and just never slowed down. Where did he start? I was reading he was like a Motown guy. Yeah, he was born in Georgia. I'm totally forgetting the name of the town from Georgia, but they uh, his hometown, I know, has like named a street after him at this point, and he gets a lot of hometown love. Yeah, he Detroit was like a big second home for him eventually. Kind of get into the history on that. 
in just a little bit. One of the other things in like early in my getting into Bohan and like, you know, I'd bought two records at the same time as buying several hundred other records and was like, okay, I like this guy, keep an eye out for him. And I remember specifically picking up the 1983 album Bohan and Drive. And the the pattern I'd noticed at that point, like if an artist started at about like 1980, their early 80s records were probably going to be good. But if an artist started in like the early 70s, by the time they hit the 80s, it usually like falls flat. Like they just don't know what to do with that switch from guitars to synthesizers. I remember being really impressed that Bohannon just seemed to handle that transition more naturally than any artist I'd ever heard before. Like his synth heavy stuff honestly hits even harder than his guitar based stuff. And he's just like a complete natural. And uh, since then, I noticed he put out records well into the late 80s. I think his last album was 1990. And I, I went and like found some clips from that stuff. And yeah, not necessarily following the trends of what's selling, but just like adapting with new instrumentation, figuring out new rhythms, and just still following this like cutting edge underground vibe to everything he was doing. By that point, I knew like, okay, this is now one of my favorite soul artists and I got to like pay more attention to this guy, really figure out what's going on. I remember doing like a little bit of research early on and seeing, oh, he was the band leader for Motown's road band in the late sixties. And he was also apparently best friends with Stevie Wonder. I was like, okay, this, this makes a lot of sense. Now this guy has got the history to back up this career. You know, it's uh, interesting how you point out the transition from bands from the 60s and 70s and the 80s. I feel like the whole industry and uh, most artists had a hard time with that transition. If he is one of the best ones to do it, that's that's really impressive because I think it just across the gamut, musically, people were having a tough time totally. in the 80s with the transition, especially a lot of 60s and uh, 70s classic rock artists were definitely, oh, definitely. Yeah. having just Queen were putting times. messages saying that... <laughs> There were no synthesizers that appeared on their albums up to a, <laughs> up to a certain point, and then they just gave in. Yeah. Crazy. I, even, like, other funk bands that I really respect, like Earth, Wind, and Fire and stuff like that, kind of started petering out around this point and just didn't feel at home anymore. It's like, didn't know what they were doing with the new vibes, the new sounds, the new instruments. But, yeah, something about Bohan, and he just was always on point. Adaptable. hmm We can kind of dive into... A little bit of his early history at this point. From what I understand, he started playing drums when he was seven years old. He used to, I guess he had the drum set set up in the living room and he would try and learn by playing along with the commercials while his mom and family members were watching TV. So like his his earliest exposure was just being able to literally adapt every 30 seconds to a new sound and new beat, which like makes so sense why he was so in tune with what was going on after that and able to just be so versatile. I'd watched some interviews with him saying that even in like grade school, he was starting bands and he was the kid that was playing at all the school dances and the functions and he had weekend gigs every weekend. Instead of being the one that was going out and partying, he was hosting the parties that everybody else was going to all through like school and stuff like that and he tried to be a teacher like a music teacher after high school shortly after that and um, just pretty quickly got connected with some high level musicians and just kind of his career took off in his early 20s is he still in georgia at this point i think that's where he's living at this point yeah I i think he was also in chicago for a little while too there was a pretty close connection with him and a lot of early chicago house musicians so yeah he got to work with a handful of really famous musicians when he was kind of coming up as a young player some of the most notable ones he was in a band with a guy named hank moore who was hank ballard's band leader and band director at that point he also worked with the Iceman, Jerry Butler, and most notably, he was in a band with Jimi Hendrix for a little while. Chitlin, club circuit kind of thing. The big defining moment for him, he was offered a gig on a two-week tour with a kind of more underground soul singer named Gorgeous George, not to be confused with the wrestler of the same name. <laughs> and right before the tour started, he had a pretty bad foot injury to the point where he couldn't play drums anymore. And he decided, like, this tour is too important. We're going to be playing with these Motown acts at points on the tour and all these other people, and i got to do this. So he rearranged his whole drum kit so that he played kick drum with the other, with, like, his good foot. 
because uh yeah he had like hurt his right foot so he, he like switched the whole thing around so he could like relearn how to play drums in a couple of days and then hit the road and right. did the whole tour the recurring theme is adaptability goes a long way totally yeah and that's literally what did it for him he met a bunch of motown people he became real close with stevie wonder who at that point was still little stevie wonder when he was like 13 on the road with motown yeah and pretty quickly was offered a job to come up to detroit start playing with motown start touring with them and he eventually was the leader of the uh, 15 no 16 piece touring band for motown and he did that from 1967 to 1972. The band was known as Bohannon and the Motown Sound. Wow, I have not, never heard of this guy. I know, right? <laughs> Same. I mean, but the, the, that theme does happen with a lot of other Motown artists. People didn't even know about the Funk Brothers until that documentary came out. And there's so many key players and musicians and backing artists that just extreme like record aficionados are going to know about it. But the average person doesn't. It's not a household name. Most notably was Stevie Wonder's drummer. Um, that was like how he got his start. But the thing was that Stevie Wonder couldn't play all the clubs on the tour dates. So he, again, the adaptability theme, he got used to having to back all the other Motown artists that were on tour with Stevie Wonder, which is how he got the gig as the band leader, because it was like, oh, this guy can just jump in on literally any band on this roster and do just fine. We should just give them the entire like, band, the entire gig. Let's jump back into another track. Let's just go ahead and do track two, the beat part two. Was that one all instrumental up until that point? Uh, yeah, there's less vocals on this track than there are on some of the other albums. Let's see. While you're looking at that record, I just wanted to comment on how ridiculous that record looks. <laughs> totally. So, yeah, again, this is one of my reasons for selecting this specific album. Um, we've talked in previous episodes about how a lot of records will really jump out at you from the interesting cover art. And you kind of pick it up and be like, oh, this looks cool. I want to see what it sounds like. But then there's the other side of it where sometimes the record looks stupid, but it, the music is still great. And sometimes trust your gut and sometimes maybe just go with the opposite of your gut and just see what happens. If you got time to make a big stack of records to try out, fill it up with some random stuff and see what you like. Yeah, I don't think that every uh, art department working for record companies was really in touch with how to represent the music and not totally every musician can be responsible for directing that either it i mean it represents the music pretty well it's just yeah three disco ladies clearly cutting loose but that's all it is <laughs> but I, you know like the font for the bohannon name on it is, looks like super cheesy and not very hip it's got like this weird color scheme and it's just it's a very like goofy light looking album cover 
I don't like. I, I don't look at this and think like, oh, this is probably some like heavy, hard cutting, heavy funk disco stuff. I'm gonna think, oh, this is probably a really light, super string heavy dance music, maybe a little disco vibe, you know. When you see ladies in leotards, that means they're ready to dance. So I'm <laughs> kind of going by that cover and the leotards. So the vocals are all by Caroline Crawford, who is a frequent collaborator with Bohan, and she did a couple solo records as well that were basically just more solo Bohannon records. He still like produced and wrote everything. She was just on the cover with her name. And it's funny because those are all $20 and up records, even though they're just Bohannon records, but there was more Bohannon albums coming out. You can find them easier. So those are all 3 to $5 records for the most part. So we touched on Bohannon's early history, his Motown roots. In 1972, Motown made the infamous move to transition from Detroit based to California based and a lot of the artists at Motown decided to stay in Detroit for various reasons and Bohannon one was one of the ones who did not make the move so he ended his Motown career at that point but just immediately kept with that adaptability theme started some new bands got signed to a new record label he uh started with a couple pretty notable early or younger musicians at that point his first bands had both Dennis Coffey on guitar and also uh, Ray Parker Jr., who would go on to be known as the uh, Ghostbusters mm-hmm. theme song musician. <laughs> Honestly, we'll probably cover some Ray Parker Jr. in a later episode because it's I think it's kind of almost criminal that he's only known for that because he was such a talented musician. His records are super good. The Ghostbusters theme song is fine, but it's like super cheesy and it's like a weird legacy for him to be left with. I'm trying to place Dennis Coffey. Dennis was one of the white Motown house musicians. He was one of the guys that was key in uh, the like psychedelic sound yeah, and like the wah heavy guitar. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he kind of he came on later in Motown, started in like the production side and the house band in like the late '60s, around the time that you're getting like Temptation, Psychedelic Shack, and things like yeah. that. He was one of the main guys responsible for that new shift in sound. Dennis Coffey is also just one of those guys that we talked about starting to familiarize yourself with session musicians. If you see a record and Dennis Coffey is on it, 95% chance that it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to find his solo records, which are almost impossible. So yeah. if you see any solo Dennis Coffey, just buy it immediately. Yeah, and uh, send it to our P.O. box so we can make sure Earl gets his copies. <laughs> yes, send us a duplicate, actually. <laughs> I, missed the, I missed the record store day release, so I'm still hurting about that one. Yeah, four copies, one for each of us, plus Earl. That would be ideal. Uh, we'll link the P.O. box. Probably never. You know, he started putting out solo records in 72, started recording them. Eventually started his own label called Phase 2 Productions, which happened shortly after the record we're talking about today, Cut Loose. And then after that, Bohannon kind of got his, I don't know, at this point, fourth fresh wind in the music industry when a lot of the seeds of house music DJs started picking up on Bohannon stuff. He had a couple songs that were some big early house music smash hits were just like samples and edits of Bohannon music. Another thing that I found really interesting about him is a lot of musicians from his time period were really against sampling. You know, there's just like countless stories of these classic musicians who uh, have samples that have been used like hundreds of times and they've never gotten paid at all for it and are like, hip hop sucks and house music is terrible and I hate that kind of music and I don't want to be a part of it. Whereas apparently from day one, Bohan was like, no, people can sample my music. I just want to get paid. So like everybody was using his music. He had all the proper channels set up to get royalties for all of it. And he was like probably making more money off house music royalties than he even like had been for like several years before that point. Once again, he was just ready to make that transition. (laughs) He had like zero problems with it. He also apparently like had lawyers ready to go if anybody sampled his stuff and didn't get permission. He had no problem suing you if you were like not getting him those checks. (laughs) Hanging them over a balcony. (laughs) Totally. The the one quote from his interview that I love that he, he says, I'd be getting my checks. And he's still just doing that. Like he's... He's on on top of that music business side of it, and you know he, it seems to be able have been able to live a comfortable life in the music industry the whole time. Which like countless stories of like these tragic talented figures who died too young in poverty because like they weren't actually getting paid for any of the stuff they've done. Bo knows. Yep. Read your contracts <laughs> for real. Hire lawyers. <laughs> 
But yeah, like we had talked about the house music connection. He was one of the first guys to have those long, hard-hitting grooves. He kind of talked about how once disco became popular, everyone was about these overproduced, really smooth, really string section heavy songs. And he said he was just listening to it thinking, well, they're obviously all influenced by me, but they're not making music that I think is very good. So I see no reason to imitate this. If you look at the other popular records that came out in 79 when he dropped this record, I mean, you got like Bee Gees, Spirits of Flown, Donna Summer, Bad Girls, Michael Jackson's Off the Wall. Only a few disco artists were still hanging out and just like doubling down with that smooth sound. And then you also had the change of like the seeds of new wave and punk were starting to hit the radio. You were talking about how he kind of just hits that groove and stays on mm-hmm. it for so long. And it feel like you take Donna Summer's album, Bad Girls, from that same time period. I think each side has a different vibe to it. Like there's four different, it's, it's a double LP and yeah. Yeah. it's got, it has a different mood to it on each mm-hmm. one of those. Like she was kind of trying every facet of disco. And I, I like, I love that album. Isn't there like a ballad side, yes. kind of a dance side. And then, yeah. And Bohannon's so. like, no, we're just going to party. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in a way he, like we kind of talked about, he's aware of what the hits are and it has his own like underground version of it. And I feel like you can kind of hear that in this album. It's got, some of that like really hard hitting almost like punk feel to it but it's got like the disco grooves and the extended tracks and he's just taking everything that's around him and still putting like the like official bow hand and twist on it and doing exactly the record he wants to make and if you look at the album credits most of the time with disco you'll have the band leader that has like one credit and then there's like five other producers that are on it every bohannon record is engineered by produced by written by arranged by bohannon all the way through like he just had his hands on every element of the music like no one was compromising this stuff with him Quality control. yep one of the last things i wanted to mention with bohannon on as far as like interesting uh business decisions that kept him relevant early on he said that he kind of noticed this trend that a lot of popular radio djs were not always saying the name of the artist they'd play a string of tracks and maybe mention like the first and last one of who was played And he was so frustrated. I was on the radio. No one knows who it was. So he had the idea that he, during his like extended grooves, he was just going to like either himself or someone in the band just start saying his name in the middle of the track. So there's, yeah, there's so many Bohannon songs where it's this extended groove and then you just hear Bohannon. That's amazing. (laughs) And I feel there's another Bo that did that in his songs. Bo Diddley. Yeah, totally. (laughs) He always threw his name in there too. I think partly as a result of that, he got the major shout out from Tom Tom Club in their big hit Genius of Love. There's some of the extended parts where they're kind of name dropping influential musicians and Bohannon's one of them. James Brown. Yep, exactly. Yep, yep. (laughs) Do you have another, any other selections you wanted to jam? Yeah, let's, uh, let's just go ahead and close with the closing track on the album. That's the way it goes.
That gives me, yeah, you mentioned that he was involved in the house scene and I can definitely hear that Mm -hmm. and how sort of the EDM like four on the floor where like the beat is static, but in reality, these things are kind of slowly shifting behind it. Yeah. And a, a lot of the contemporary disco stuff was that four on the floor beat, but that was like the the beat was a little bit of the background and then the string section and the synthesizers were the front element that was going over top of this. Whereas his music is like the beat is front and center and everything else is like subtly shifting in the background. I it, haven't noticed, is he hitting the one a lot of the time? The James Brown one? He's he's hitting all of them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, he believes it's on every beat. Totally. There was actually a pretty strong James Brown connection going on between Bohannon and James Brown. Apparently they did a lot of shows together and James Brown was a huge Bohannon fan. At one point, the the quote is that uh, Bohannon claims James Brown told him that they were the two guys with the most different rhythms than anybody. (laughs) And was just saying like, you know, James was all about rhythm and how that repetitive groove and everything was the backbone of the music and the most important part. And he felt that Bohannon was one of the only other guys on the circuit that really understood that at the same level that James Brown did. Yeah, that's a high compliment. Yeah, James didn't just toss around compliments. If he said no. you were dope, he meant it. <laughs> and if he didn't like your music, he might like try and shoot you. Like yeah, <laughs> there, there was no there's no halfway with James. Severe <laughs> consequences for not yeah. delivering in front of him. I kind of noticed a lot of similarities to Fatback Band, and I know I've definitely mixed uh, Bohannon and Fatback Band together, so it's kind of in the same vein of using how they use the beat and the extended rhythms, and not so much the strings and the mm-hmm. disco flourishes that you're accustomed to. So, And Fatback was another group that James Brown repped hard. They actually was like on an intro of one of their albums, which I always thought was just like the coolest thing. Like He dropped his Fatback record, and it's just James Brown, like, ladies and gentlemen, funkiest band on the east coast fat back like oh shit like that (laughs) like to be able to have said that on like an early record of yours at that time period man that's like crazy bragging rights it's all endorsement (laughs) while we have you here mr dj earl um i wanted to ask for maybe people listening who maybe want to try out spinning records would you have any tips uh being a pro dj yourself well, what started me, well, I have to say first I started by making mixtapes. So I made numerous mixtapes and just kind of putting songs together and then work on like probably doing the technical stuff a little later, but just really making playlists, just seeing how songs work together in, in a context. Getting those transitions. Yeah, that's the most important thing is the transitions. <laughs> and then making a complete set and doing it for like an hour and keeping people, you know, involved. I try to have waves, so I try to take them up and down. It's kind of my mythology with it. But yeah, just listen to music, listen to a lot of music. One of the reasons I wanted to be a DJ was because um, just my musical taste and I wanted to spread that around. So, I mean, I do hip hop, funk, soul. I've done indie rock, jazz sets. I mean, I never wanted to be like stigmatized as a one genre DJ. So that was my whole goal was just get DJing out of just being one genre or you just do house or you just do hip hop or because I don't listen to music like that. So I can never DJ like that. So that was really my whole like goal, just multi genre and just make it all work somehow. Yeah. And as a live dj as well i'm always looking for some of those tracks and artists that work really well as transitions between different styles of music and i feel like bohanna is a really good example of that like we talked about with him being an influence on house music if you want to do a set that started with like more like 70s funk but then transitioned into that house sound bohanna is obviously the perfect link you know you could also transition between an earlier in the night kind of lighter jazz thing and you're trying to like step up the party Hamilton's that perfect halfway point. If you've already got the crowd, like the floor packed with some of the hit songs and you need an extended track with like a really good beat that everyone's going to feel, Bohannon's your guy once again. That Bohannon bridge. Mm-hmm. The Bohannon sound. <laughs> Get it in your record collection today. Hamilton Bohannon. Cool. 
Well, is there anything else that you want to touch on with this particular artist, Sean? I think we've sold Bohannon pretty well. Yeah, I hope so. I hope like I'm not the only one repping Bohannon anymore after this. The word <laughs> is finally out. You're welcome. <laughs> Do you think a consequence, a byproduct of us doing this podcast and how much it's going to move culture is going to be that these records will go up in value? I think that's the only possible outcome of us doing a podcast. I think we're ruining these records for everybody. So when you're listening to this, after you've obviously subscribed and you're checking these new episodes out the moment they're released, go get these records while you can. Because yeah, like, they're going to be now. gone now. Get them while they're hot. True. If you can find them. Yeah. That's the key. If exactly. you can find them, pick them up. Mm-hmm. But that's part of the adventure. Those Discogs median values are about to skyrocket. This has been another I'd buy that for a dollar. My name is Jeremy Ruggles. My name is Peter Cook. I'm Sean Hartman. And I'm Earl Jordan. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Oh, thank One you. thing I wanted uh, to yeah. ask, Sean, did you notice that my shirt fits your, the introduction that you gave me? Well, I noticed that your entire life fits the introduction that I gave you. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I literally like was making this list of introductions. Like, okay, I got to get like a super obscure Star Wars reference for Peter. So I just Googled obscure Star Wars characters. Found like a top fifty list and scrolled right to number one, and that's Max Rebo and the Jizz Whalers. So yeah, yeah, that is a genre of music in the Star Wars universe. Would Peter, Jizz. would you like to tell us about Max Rebo and the Jizz Whalers? We'll save that for another podcast. Okay, bye. <laughs>